Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Learn Live session here at Microsoft Ignite. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Brett, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. It's a little later in the evening in our Pacific Standard Time, but I'm excited to get this going. Uh, so what are we going to do today? We are going to walk you through uh, a Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Learn module called Manage Meetings, Conferences, and Events with Microsoft Teams. Now, my name is Brett Poland. I'm actually a Teams product manager, and I work with the MS uh, Learn team and IT Pro Skilling and Readiness. And Stephen, how about you? i am uh, been a Microsoft now for 12 years. I'm a senior product uh, marketing manager for Teams, and I'm the host of Inside Microsoft Teams, which you can check out at aka.ms slash Inside MS Teams. And if you have questions or you want to reach out to me later, you can find me at Stephen L. Rose on Twitter. And Brett is at Brett Pollen on Twitter. So you can reach out to us if you have additional questions and things that we just don't get to today. So, hey, thanks for joining us. We're here. We're live. We're excited to get your questions. We're excited to dive into all the great MS Learn content. So, Brett, why don't you kind of walk us through uh, what we're going to be doing here tonight? So here you see this is actually the uh, a quick link to the Learn module on MS Learn that we're going to be covering today. Uh, but what we're actually doing today is we're going to go step by step through this guide. It's going to be a deep dive. Uh, you want to go to the next slide there. We'll go step by step and we'll do a deep dive on this on this uh, this module. We're also going to use interactive guides. We've created some interactive guides that will give you some hands on learning. And then we also want to answer your questions. And you'll notice that uh, we will be stopping. Uh, in, in, during the during this presentation, we'll actually be taking your questions and not just waiting till the end. So sessions session live. Is yeah, interactive. Absolutely, where we could step on each other and talk on each other. And John is saying good evening from Kansas City. So thanks, John, for joining us. But ask your questions, say hi, let us know if we're hitting on the right content, if we're answering your questions. And hey, that that's what we're here for. And that's what we're excited to do. So... Teams lifecycle, it's important to understand the overall lifecycle. And we just relaunched our docs.microsoft.com slash Teams page today. And it's important to understand as we talk about what happens before you roll this out, the different phases. So you start with pilot. Pilot is we're going to test this. We're going to test our apps. We're going to pick a small group of users. We're going to see how it works. Step two, incredibly important, is before you roll anything out to an end user is you have to go through and prepare for end user adoption. You need to figure out how are, you know, who are our stakeholders and why are we moving to teams and how are we going to get people ready and what are the resources and learning portals and how their everyday work is going to change due to this. And it's so important to figure all that out. A lot of people go ahead and deploy and then they go to, to, to go ahead and train and they find out that people aren't using teams to the level that they want to. Then go ahead and plan for your enterprise uh, deployment. If you're a small business, we cover that in the pilot section. We'll then go through deploying, securing, and all the content that you're looking for around managing, locking it down, governance between security and manage is going to be there. So we encourage you to, uh, as you're looking to go deeper, to go into docs, to check out that team lifecycle and go ahead and move through. So, Brett, why don't you walk us through this managing Teams collaboration with Microsoft Teams? So, what I want to first do is kind of lay out what it, what a module is and what a learning path is. So, on Microsoft Learn, we have a collection of learning paths. And this learning path that we are covering a portion of is called Manage Team Collaboration with Microsoft Teams. This is about a three-hour learning path. And underneath it, you'll see we have set different modules. And these all run about 52 minutes to an hour. And these are things you could do during your lunch hour. And you can see that we prepare in the collaboration space around Teams, we prepare for our, our deployment, we deploy, we manage, we manage uh, bots and connectors, similar to that life cycle that uh, Steve was talking about. And we're gonna jump into that manage meetings and conferences events uh, with Microsoft Teams. And if you actually wanna go uh, to that uh, module and follow along, you can go to aka.ms slash learn teams collaboration. So what are we going to learn? What what are our objectives today? Uh, we want to prepare uh, prepare for a Teams deployment with Microsoft 360. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. 
Uh, we want to prepare for meeting and conference deployment. So once you've already deployed teams, we want to prepare for those meeting, setting up those meeting policies, uh, audio conferencing, those kind of things. What are those settings? What about recordings? What about uh, audio conferencing? As I said, what about live events, the, the things that we're doing here at Ignite? And then how do we at the end monitor this so that we can make it better, so we can actually find out if our call quality is good enough or if we need to make some 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 tweaks? So let's start right. off with our introduction to Teams meeting and conferencing, Stephen. All right. So, you know, once you've rolled out Teams, uh, chat, Teams channels, apps, et cetera, you're going to have two different types of meetings that you're going to do, private meetings and channel meetings. Channel meetings are meetings that you do, wait for it, inside the channel. It's with the people in that channel. So if you have a team that is marketing, that is sales, et cetera, that doesn't include people that are external guests, things like that, you can just go ahead and schedule a meeting right there in the channel it pops up, people click on it, everybody's able to view. And it's really a very simple and easy way to meet with a group of people. The other type of meetings are private meetings. These are meetings where you uh, bring in folks ad hoc. This could be people from other teams within the company. It could just be one other person, or it could include external guests and external users. So private meetings, meetings that someone that a person or a group of people are chairing with a diverse group of people versus a channel meeting, a meeting that includes all the people that are part of that specific channel inside of Teams. Now, accessing meetings from multiple clients. Brett, why don't you take this part? Yeah, actually, this is, this is really quick and simple. You can access Teams and meetings from multiple clients. You can do it through your desktop. You can do it on your mobile phone. You can do it in a browser. We actually have Teams rooms for on-site Teams meetings in actual conference rooms with uh, Teams room devices. And then again, as I said, phones where you're just doing audio conferencing. So this, think of this as, a, as not using the internet browser. You're just calling in uh, like we used to do in the old days. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about the meeting and conferencing prerequisites. So Exchange Online. Exchange Online is part of Office 365, uh, Microsoft 365. Exchange Online is really important. And what's great is the policies that you've set up for Exchange Online on sharing, on managing, security, DLP, those extend out to SharePoint and OneDrive and therefore also start to move itself into Teams on how you're managing data since SharePoint is that back end. SharePoint Online, obviously incredibly important piece of that. And Azure AD, Azure AD is incredibly important. It is what allows you to work with external guests and external users. If you are on-prem or hybrid, you're going to find that you're going to be doing a lot of extra work and individually adding guests and bringing them in. So the Azure AD portion is incredibly important because that's going to be, uh, you know, adding a lot of those verification tools that you're going to need. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. A verified domain for Microsoft 365 and TCP ports, pretty standard 80 and 443. Those are your normal web ports outgoing. And for UDP, 3478 and 3481 for outgoing. It's important that those are not blocked. If you have those blocked for some reason or you're doing a proxy, you're going to want to take that into account uh, before you go ahead and start to deploy Teams. All right, let's talk about some of the different roles in your core deployment decisions as you start to move through this. So first off is Teams admin roles. Who's going to play what role within your company? It's incredibly important that you understand that Teams does set a, uh, you know, allow you to set a custom administrator just for Teams. Somebody had asked earlier, hey, should the global admin been doing everything? No, you should have the same way that you global admin does not go in and manage print servers or manage other aspects that you should have different levels of Teams roles that give a certain amount of control, but not uber control over the whole product, because it's important that you're able to track what's happening and what's going on. 
meeting settings. There are a variety of meeting settings and meeting policies that you're going to need to really think about. Can anonymous users join a meeting? How do you want to turn on QoS, quality of service, and how are these going to be leveraged? So you really want to start to think before you deploy who's going to be coming in, who's going to be coming out, who can create meetings, who can't, et cetera. Meeting policies. Are we going to allow people to dial in? Are we going to allow people to use cameras? Are we going to allow chat? Are we going to allow recording? All of those types of things are the things that you want to think about, about how meeting policies will come together and how they will uh, be managed by individual folks, as well as audio conferencing policies. Now, that sounds a little bit different as we take a look at, our, uh, you know, audio conferencing, but if you're still using PSTN, if you have PBX, are you going to allow folks to just dial into a meeting without video from a phone? How is that going to be moved through your switcher? So for those of you that are on Skype for business and still using a PBX system and moving over to Teams, these are some areas that you're going to want to take a look at. And of course, meeting rooms and personal device policies. Meeting rooms or Teams rooms, as we often refer to them, are a great way to create touchdown spots. But again, uh, is it going to be centrally managed? When I walk in, can I automatically take a call that I have on my cell and move it into that Teams rooms? What are device policies? Am I going to allow people to access Teams from every device or only through specific devices or through WVD or through a browser? So these are all kind of questions you want to sit down and you want to talk about early. Next, we'll take a look at some additional decisions. Bandwidth planning. It's incredibly important uh, to think about what that situation is going to be like. And a really good example is uh, many of you were all working out of an office and then you quickly switch to a hybrid or even a virtual mode. And all of a sudden bandwidth planning, you hadn't really thought about split tunneling VPNs and things like that. People now going from a small portion of people that are using Teams to everybody in the company, to everybody turning on their camera. So you should think about bandwidth, how that rolls up, and how that's going to affect the user, and what creates the best user experience, and how to ensure that. That's incredibly, um, um, not just important, but it's really something you want to think about so that you get the level of quality and the experience that people expect with Teams. Meeting, recording, and archiving. This becomes important on two different levels. Number one, are you going to allow everybody to or certain people to record meetings? Those meetings go into Stream or OneDrive. It's great to be able to easily access those, but how are they going to be uh, archived? And as you take a look at security and compliance, that you can go back and see what was said in those. It's also important to understand that once meetings are recorded and dropped into Stream or OneDrive, you're now going to get things like transcription, which allows you to search meetings and go to specific areas or look for parts of those meetings where you were mentioned. So that tool is rather important. Live event policies, as you take a look at live events like the one that we're doing right here, you again want to think about how many people, what are the rights of those folks? Are they going to be able to ask questions, uh, invites, et cetera? Uh, should anybody be allowed to create a live event or webinar, as you often know it as or not? Conference room system rollout, how are we going to do this? What rooms are we going to drop these into? How is it going to be managed? What are the rights? Is that people allowed to just start calls? Can they accept? Cloud video interoperability, again, another thing when you really you want to take a look at closely for bandwidth usage and how that's going to roll up in areas. Personal device rollout, troubleshooting, meeting and call quality, which we'll go into a little bit deeper later on. Operating your meeting service, how to go through and do that. And finally, licensing. Licensing plays a big role in what features functionality, especially around things like um, being able to use labels and aspects of security, the licensing portion of this is going to be an important thing to think about. And if you have the right license to allow you to achieve what you want to do. Brett, did I forget anything there? Did I forget no, I think that? you got it. Awesome. All right. Let's talk about activity reports. Activity reports are great. You have this inside your dashboard and it's going to tell you one of two things. First, if you have a low usage score, well, that means not everybody's using it, then you need to prioritize your training and communication. I talked about this a little bit earlier. I'll give you a real world example. We had uh, a customer who gave anybody who wanted to download Teams and use Teams within their company the ability to go ahead and do it. 
What's great is 80% of their users downloaded Teams. What's not so good, they were only using the chat functionality. So ensuring that people are properly trained in how to use all the functionality, understanding the relationship between SharePoint, OneDrive, where they're sharing files, how they're uploading it, using it for chats, et cetera, becomes incredibly important. So if you're seeing low usage scores, take a look at that. If you're seeing low quality scores, that means the calls themselves are low quality. We want to take a look and identify network bandwidth issues, connectivity issues, how you have different things setting up. Uh, things along that line are incredibly important. So I have one question here I want to answer. And then Brett, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you do a demo. David asked, probably off topic, but any cases of using Teams as a learning management system for the enterprise, even more specifically for higher education? Yes. How does Harvard sound to you? Uh, Harvard is using a combination of Teams and SharePoint as an LFS system. We have a ton of customers. If you go into our case study area, you will see that. So uh, it's a combination of Teams and SharePoint. So what we're seeing is through SharePoint, we actually have a, have, have a template that allows you to create SharePoint sites that will actually track training, tell people what training is next, what they need to do guides them through it, gives them a checklist, and then you can actually use Teams to surface up those pages and to let them know uh, that they have training that's due at a certain time by using Power Apps, Power BI, I'm sorry, Power Apps and uh, different things and flows that can set that off and tell it. So it's really a combination of Teams and SharePoint that can be used, but um, I'll try to find the link for you and put that in. But if you type in Teams Learning Management System SharePoint, you'll find that link and it will go into it. Or if you go to adoption.microsoft.com, you'll find it right there under end user training. And we have a whole site dedicated to that at adoption.microsoft.com. All right, Brett, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can give us a demo. Great, let's uh, let's dig in here. I like to keep this a little exciting by doing some interactive uh, demos here. So one of the things that Stephen mentioned in our core deployment decisions for Teams meetings was admin roles. So we're going to take a look at, exciting, at assigning them. And to do this, we're going to be using one of our Teams interactive guides. These guides are available on docs.microsoft.com, and they're actually integrated in several of our Teams Microsoft Learn modules. You can see all of these guides by going to our Teams landing page on MS Learn, and we'll take a look at that in a second. And then if you want to follow along with this guide, you can actually go to aka.ms slash manage meetings IG and that'll take you directly to this guide. So let's jump into this guide here. All righty. So what I took you to is this is actually the MS Learn homepage. I wanted to show you the easy way to get to these guides. If you just click on products and teams, this will take you to our Teams landing page on MS Learn. And there's lots of content here. I'm going to scroll past this for a second. You'll see that there's all these great learning paths that are just not just on Teams meetings, but on uh, security, direct routing, onboarding, navigating. But up here, there's three boxes here. The tech community on the left, this is a great place to, uh, to find information from other uh, people in the community that have questions and answers. Uh, in the middle, the interactive video and demos, which is what I wanted to click on. So we'll click see the guides. And here you'll see this is a list of all of our team's interactive guides, and you can click on them right there. So let's jump into that team's meeting guide, and let's talk about what is an interactive guide. You'll see here, this is kind of a hybrid between uh, our hands-on labs that you would have in a physical Ignite, and then a web app that you would have a click-through demo that you would do uh, in the comfort of your own home. Uh, so we've tried to combine those two. This is built with HTML5 and using Adobe Captivate. If you notice in the URL, and I'll try to zoom in, let me, let me make it so you guys can see here. Let me, there we go. Whoops, let me go back out. Uh, you'll notice there's uh, three, a little three box here. This is a feature of Edge right here. This is this is the ability you can actually download this guide and work on it offline if you'd like. It is actually an Edge web app. So now let's do this. Uh, there we go. A little more room to see. So on the left, like a traditional uh, hands-on lab, we have our sandbox. This is our environment that we were working on. And then on the right, we have our instruction set. And you can see it's a lot like a hands-on lab. There is specific to-do tasks with checkboxes. And as you go through this uh, this uh, exercise, those checkboxes will check off automatically for you. 
We can also change the theme to dark. And one of the nice things is we can save the transcript. What that will do is it'll download a PDF so that you can have the instruction set and then use it with your own tenant. Uh, and when I click and start the interactive guide, you can see I have a table of concept content. There's four exercises here. We're going to do this first exercise right now around assigning a team's admin role for Contosa meeting rollout. Now, using AAD, you can designate different levels of access for managing teams meetings. Now, they can manage the entire team's workload, like a team, like a, a global administrator or a team's administrator, or they can have delegated permissions for managing meetings in conference configuration or troubleshooting quality issues. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and we are going to assign Patty Fernandez of Contoso Corporation uh, to the team's communication administrator role. So I am the global admin and I'm also a team's admin, but I want I need some help. So let's click on this and you'll see we takes us to the Microsoft 365 Security Center here. Uh, and I'm just going to click on show all. And we need to. Uh, assign roles. So we are going to click on Azure Active Directory. And you'll see if I don't click in the right spot, you'll see a little box that gives me a hint says, try again. You want to click on Azure Directory. Great. So now we're in Azure Directory. We're in the Azure Directory blade. And we want to go to roles and administrators. If I click on roles and administrators, you can see there's lots of roles that show up that are already in, that are already part of your deployment. If I scroll down, we're going to go and I'm zoom in here because I can barely even read it is the team's communication administrator. So we're going to click on that. They can manage meetings, calling features within Microsoft Teams service. Zoom back out and I am going to add a, add someone to that role. So I'm going to click add assignment here. You can see that there is a, a search box. I'll zoom in on that and I'm just going to type Patty. Oops, there we go. And Patty Fernandez shows up. And I can just click on her, click on add, and I have success, successfully uh, set up Patty Fernandez as a Teams administrator, communication administrator role. And you can see on the right, you can see all the checkboxes. They do them all themselves. Apparently, I didn't click the X button at the end. Now, the another role we can use is the Teams communication support engineer. So let's go down here to the Teams communication support engineer who can troubleshoot communication in issues using Teams advanced tools. And then I want to add that assignment. And we'll go back to our list over here on the right. And this time I don't need to search because I can see his name's right here. I'm just going to click on Alan DeYoung. And so look, there he goes. And he is now also part of the Teams communication support engineer. Pretty easy. And you can see it's now checked off that first exercise. So this is a great way to get some hands on skilling without getting into a real environment and making mistakes along the way. This will keep you on those rails so you can follow along with what exactly we are doing. So let's go back to our presentation. All right. There we go. And we just want to do a little checkup with you guys because we're going to we're going to ask you guys questions in the middle of this as we go along as well. All right. So let's do our knowledge check. So Microsoft Teams offers which two types of meetings? Was it private and group, channel and group or private and channel? All right, well, let's walk this through. We have a lot of time. There's a delay, so we're going to we're going to take our time answering these while you guys fill out the poll question in your chat. Now, private and group. I know private is definitely right. I'm not sure what a group meeting is. Is that like uh, a, is it a group of people? I guess maybe well, like, I, I guess a group of people and then a channel and group. Uh, well, I feel like a channel is a group of people, so a channel and group doesn't really make sense. Um, and I'm looking at the at the poll right now. <clears throat> I think, of course, it's private and channel because Stephen was very specific on what are the two types of meetings we offer, private and channel. I was. Uh, it like It looks like in our poll, 90, 91, 90, uh, it's dropping. 90% of you believe it's private and channel. And are they we were correct. correct. Yes. yes, they are correct. Nicely done. 
Awesome. All so, right. Uh, it looks like we have another question. If you can uh, take a look at that one, Stephen. We do. Yeah, absolutely. I got uh, this. Is great. Can you tell me uh, best practices for sharing video from presentation and meeting? We tried to play some LQ videos, videos uploaded to MS Stream, and share it via screen sharing to a meeting, but then how had horrible lags. How can we share videos and presentation PowerPoint without lags? That is a great question. Um, there's a few factors in this. Number one, don't stream a video that you're streaming a video. So what that means is, A, have the video local to your device so that it's PowerPoint, but you're playing it locally through PowerPoint. So you have a local copy of it, number one. Number two, turn off Outlook and all the other things running on your computer, because this is gonna take a lot of bandwidth. And if you have things like a bunch of tabs open, if you have Outlook open, that's gonna cause that to slow down. Number three, don't do this over Wi-Fi. Plug in, plug in. If you only have wireless in your house, there are, uh, you can plug directly into the modem, but I do direct, I do encourage you to do that. If you're in an office, make sure you're plugged in because you only have about 30% to 40% of the total speed available via wireless that you would have via plugged in. And then finally, with the video embedded, obviously make sure that you turn on sound. Now for some folks, if they're watching, if they're in low bandwidth, it may not look as good, but for you, this is gonna ensure that you're gonna have the best quality video. Everything's turned off except for Teams. The video is local. It's embedded right into the PowerPoint and that you are plugged in. So hopefully that answers those questions. Uh, and to even and go one step go. further with Please. PowerPoint, we've done some PowerPoints that were just huge with videos. And we actually found it was better to store those videos not embedded into the PowerPoint, but linked into the PowerPoint, yeah. because that slowed PowerPoint down, not to it mention does. now doing it over Teams. Yes, it also makes your PowerPoints incredibly large, which makes it very, very difficult to continue to save and update those. So that's even better. But if you have to embed it, have a local. But if not, yes, if you can just what you do is you click a link and you can do that. Embed a link for the video where you click it and it opens up and you just run it in that window. So good stuff. Awesome. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions before we move on. Hopefully that one answered it. So I think that we're doing pretty good. Oh, here we go. One or two more. Um, will the whole team be notified when I'm creating a channel meeting or only the team members who have, who, uh, who are part of that channel? Only the, the team that is part of that channel are going to get that channel meeting. Now it's anyone who you've made a part of that. So if you have 20 people, all 20 people are going to get that, you know, are going to be invited to that. Uh, if you want to do beyond that, then you want to look at a private meeting. Uh, if you make a channel with the same specs as the previous channel, but suddenly one person cannot see the channel, what could be the issue? I'm not even sure I fully understand that question. Brett, does that make, does you, do we, I think we need a little more. That, is, that, that, is, that is what I like to call a ghost in the machine. If that happens, you want to delete that channel and try again, because every once in a while, something like that will happen. There are a lot of, a lot of hooks. Uh, underneath but it's it's not something you see very often it's it's one of those it, it's a fluke uh but of course it can happen and you should be able to still add or you could try deleting that person and then re-adding them and see if that works as well okay Kristen said when arranging a meeting from a channel i cannot seem to find where comments go when someone declines i can see they have declined the actual invite but if a comment was added and where it's recorded i would assume it would go to the group mailbox of the team's channel but doesn't seem to i'm not sure on that one we may have to look into that one after we're a little bit later do you know that one brett i don't actually see the question so i'm not sure okay yeah i'm for looking some reason, at it i'm getting the half the questions too. and you're getting half Ah, okay. Got it. I'm actually not in the teleprompter mode, but I'm looking at the full channel mode. So ah, that's got cool. it. I see. Will got the whole team be need notified when I'm creating a channel yes. meeting? You already answered that, correct? Yep, already answered that one. Perfect. So we're good on that. Um, Kirsten, I'm not sure. I will find out. So we'll come back to that one a little bit later. All right. All right. So let's move a little. Let's move forward into the next step on this module, and that is managing meeting policies. Now, there are two ways to manage meeting policies. You can control these features using global policies, 
and those are org wide. That means that policy is for everyone in your organization. Or you can create custom policies, and that means that you can uh, assign them to specific groups like a marketing or an accounting team or to specific users. And the reason you would do that is one of the best ways to control uh, your meeting environment is to make those global policies really stringent, like we're not going to allow you to record those meetings or you can't uh, you can't uh, have uh, transcriptions. Really, I mean, I'm, I'm talking off the cuff, but with a custom policy, then you can go and open those up for things like I want to uh, my marketing team works with a federated organization, so they should be able to allow those users to join uh, automatically rather than having to sit in the lobby to join a meeting. So there's there's a reasons that you would do custom policies and global policies, but your global policies will tend to be the ones that are a little more stringent and more locked down. All now, right. there's two ways to manage those meeting policies. One, and my favorite because it's a GUI, is the Teams Admin Center. Uh, it's actually at the, if you just go in your tenant to uh, admin.teams.microsoft.com, that'll take you to the Teams Admin Center. And in our next demo, we'll actually be going through some of the meeting policies uh, through the Admin Center itself, so you can take a look. And then there's also PowerShell for those old school, I want to do a big load, a big bulk of users. Uh, Stephen, you're really familiar with PowerShell. Uh, I know Jeffrey Snover, so that's that would be my instinct to PowerShell. But yeah, you can go to uh, aka.ms uh, slash Teams PowerShell docs we have at the bottom. And PowerShell is exactly as Brett said, a great way if you've got to do a large number of users to bring that through. Should we dig into some of these policies, Brett? Take a look yeah, at a little more detail. Yeah, we're just going to kind of go over them really quickly because we're going to actually show these in the uh, in our in our next uh, interactive guide. But those are the general ones, allow, allow meet now in channels. That's the ability to... Uh, while you're in a chat in the upper right hand corner, you can just click on meet now and it will set up a meeting. I'm sorry, in your calendar, you can just select meet now and it will say, who do you want to meet with? You type in their name and boom, you have a meet. You'll have an impromptu meeting set up, uh, yep. allowing that Outlook add in. Uh, that's very important, especially if you're still scheduling your meetings through Outlook most of the time. If you and, add and be aware. Hang on. If you still have Skype and you don't see Outlook, you need to make sure you disable Skype and that at some point that there you turn on the Outlook and that people close Outlook and reopen it to get it. Really important. I had that question in an earlier chat. Today. And that add-in will show up at the top of your meeting. Uh, and you when you click on it, it will create a Teams meeting for you. Now, I recommend creating, you know, set, scheduling your meetings in Teams. They are uh, they do sync with your exchange calendar. That's why you did need exchange online. Uh, allow channel meeting scheduling. Pretty much uh, uh, makes sense. And then the ability to scheduling private meetings. So that just means can I do I have the ability to actually schedule a meeting with Stephen or is is this a I'm a you know, I'm a I'm a worker or a call center worker who doesn't do meetings and I don't have that ability. So let's go to audio and video. I'll take this one. How's that? Okay. Allow transcription. That's exactly that. Transcription's incredibly important. Like I said earlier, if you want to be able to search a meeting for on specific terms, it's also great if somebody was not able to attend a meeting, they can type in their name or specific terms and be able to be brought right to that point in the meeting. Cloud recording, that's either going to upload to Stream or OneDrive, depending on how you have policy set. Mode for IP audio and video for outcoming and incoming audio and video enabled. This allows you, if you don't want to have video go out at all or incoming, that you can change that. Allow IP video. NDI streaming is for those folks who are using things like Wirecast or OBS, uh, where they want to manage multicam live events. Turning on NDI streaming will do that. So if that's something you're looking to do, we do fully support that. And uh, what your media bit rate will be going out. Brett, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so content sharing, this is a big one for meetings because we all like to present PowerPoints. Uh, so you do have your the screen sharing mode, whether you can only share specific apps or the entire screen. Uh, allow a participant to give or request control. This is uh, we find this very helpful, especially in education, where you don't want your students to be able to present unless you allow them to. Especially, uh, you know, when you're doing this this learn from home scenario, it keeps the control of the meeting and keeps it secure. Uh, 
allow an external participant to give or request control. Again, like I said, with those global policies, you want to make them a little tighter. But when you are working with external participants or federated organizations, do they need to be able to present? This is one of the ways that you can lock that down uh, as a security measure to protect your your your, your data and your your uh, organization. Allow PowerPoint sharing. This is great. We just showed some of the new ways that you can do PowerPoint presentations in Teams. Always have that one on. Allow whiteboard. Uh, I don't use the whiteboard as much as others, but it's a great way to brainstorm in a meeting. And if you allow that whiteboard, they can, we can, you can click on it, and you can create a whiteboard for that specific meeting. So that that whiteboard is then shared with everyone in that meeting, so you can access it at a later time. It's also and important. Also it, yeah, and I'll add this: like I often will do meetings sometimes from an iPad. This allows me to download the Microsoft Whiteboard app and to draw on it and be part of those whiteboard sessions. So it's not that you have to only be on a Surface, uh, et cetera. You can do this from a variety of platforms. Android, uh, iOS has that Whiteboard app, but that will that is the feature that will allow you to use it in others. So I just wanted to add that. Great. And what do we have next? Participant and guests, why don't you take that, Stephen? Sure. Let anonymous people start a meeting. This is something that generally you don't want to do uh, unless you only have a very, very few amount of users uh, that you work with, but it's not always the best idea. We recommend you leave this off. Roles that have presenter rights in meetings, everyone but user can override. So that is also incredibly important that you not don't have everybody in as a presenter, but you pick who your presenter, your attendees are, and they get to set what that permission is automatically ad admit people. The default is set for everyone in your organization and federated organizations. I recommend not changing this because what you don't want to have is somebody getting a dial in, finding that information and just sneaking into a meeting without you allowing them. Again, also for a lot of uh, dial in users to by bypass the lobby, that way they show up and they have to be let in. Uh, so that way you can keep track of who's coming in. Allow meet now in private meetings. Enabling cap live captions. Um, this is great, especially as you take a look at we want to make a, a really inclusive organization. Uh, turning that on can be incredibly important for a variety of learning styles, listening styles. And I really like it because I may have be in a noisy environment like a Starbucks. I really can't hear what's going on very well, but being able to read what folks are saying in real time can make a huge difference and allow chat and meetings. This is something normally most folks turn on, but within a school organization, something like that, you may want to turn that off. So what do meeting policies affect? Well, meeting policies affect the meeting experience for users before, during, or after the meeting. They can be assigned to organizer, users, or both. So Brett, why don't you walk us through the difference between a per organizer policy, a per user policy, or a per organizer and per user policy. <laughs> This is a tongue twister. So it is. Uh, you have to be very careful how you say it. A per organizer policy is when you implement uh, all mar all the mar all the mar see, I can't uh, organize all the Martins? all yes. the meeting participants yes. inherit the same policy as the organizer. An example: if you automatically admit people, is a per organizer policy and controls whether users join the meeting directly or wait in the lobby for meetings. That assigns to that uh, go that is assigned to everybody. A per user policy is when you is uh, a policy that restricts certain features for the organizer and or meeting participants. Does that make any sense? It does. That is perfect, especially for this hour of the evening. Yeah, an example is you know, allowing meet now would be a per user policy, not rather than a than a per organizer policy. And then you can implement a combination of a per organizer and per user policy uh, based on uh, both specific people or groups or the organizer himself. An example would be allowing cloud recording is a per organizer and a per user policy. So if you turn on this setting to allow meeting the meeting organizer and participants to start and stop a recording, you're using per organizer and per user. I This is... It, this is it. This is this kind of makes me laugh because it really is just saying if you set the right policies for the right people in the right way, 
you're going to get the right policy set up for your for your organization. Correct. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have you jump into your demo. Then we have a whole bunch of questions that have come in. So we want to take some time and answer those. But let's do our configure meeting policies and settings demo. Brett, take it away and then we'll come back and I'm going to answer some of these questions while you're doing that. And then I'll pick some of the better ones to put up on the screen and we'll share them out. Great. So we are going to go back to that same interactive guide. So I'm going to leave that uh, aka.ms slash manage meetings IG up there for just a second. And now I will switch to the exercise. And it looks like there we go. So you see, we had completed that first exercise. We're now going to jump into configure meetings, policies, and settings. Uh, now, by default, for our for our uh, purpose of this exercise, Contoso has chosen to restrict anonymous and external participation in meetings, as well as limit cloud re recordings for groups <clears throat> without business need. So what we're going to do is, first of all, is we're going to review these default global settings. So I'm going to click Show All. Uh, I'm going to click on Teams. And this is that Teams admin center that I was talking about. Admin, you can see admin.teams microsoft.com in the URL. Great. Uh, and we are going to select meetings and under meetings. And I'm trying to zoom in because of the, <coughs> of the resolution. I'm hoping this helps you guys see everything. So let's click on meeting policies. And we are going to go down to our global org wide default policy. We're just going to take a look at all of these. So I'm going to zoom back out. And you'll notice that allow transcriptions is turned off. I'm sorry, allow cloud recordings is turned on. So we're going to turn that off. Let's tighten this up just a little bit. We're not going to allow that. Uh, and this is these are the actual boxes that we just showed you on those last slides. So in each policy, all of these selections are part of your choices. Uh, and then we want to, under participant and guests, verify that we let anonymous people uh, start a meeting. We certainly don't want that, so we'll leave it off. And then we also want to make sure that we automatically admit people. Everyone is set to everyone in our organization. So that means only those meetings within your organization can people just automatically uh, admit themselves. Otherwise, they would have to wait in the lobby. And we'll so we whoops. And we'll just click on save. Uh, so now those are the global those are the uh, global policies. Now let's create that very specific policy. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a, po a policy for our Mark 8 project team. Now our Mark 8 project team is working on this super secret project called the Mark 8. And if you've attended previous Ignites, we've been working on this project now for several years. Uh, I believe at one point it was also called the Mark 5. So what they need to do is they collaborate and design with a federated partner organization. So they have an external group that they work with. So they need to be able to do a little more in their meetings and have it a little more less, a little less restricted. So we are going to click and add a policy here. And we're going to, we're going to name that policy. So if I click here and you'll notice on the right hand side that I need to type in Mark 8 project team meeting policy. Next to it is these two squares. If you just click on that, that's copy and paste. So now I can just go over back over here and hit control V and voila. Uh, also, I need to create a, I'm sorry, hit enter. I need to create a description. Again, I'm gonna copy and paste from the uh, script on the right and paste that here. Voila. And now we're gonna go in and we're gonna go into our audio and video. And we are going to allow those transcriptions. We're going to turn those on now. Zoom that in. So we're going to turn those those transcriptions on and cloud recording. So we've now made this a little more uh, friendly for our federated users as well. So click down here. And because these are these these users will be external to the company, we need to allow them the ability to present. Uh, so let's go here and. Whoops, I forgot to, I'm sorry, allow an external participant to give a request control. There we go. Uh, now we're going to jump into the automatically admit people again. These guys don't need to wait in the lobby because they are part of a project that they're working on. So we want to make that to everyone in our organization and federated organizations. And I believe that's all we need to do. So we'll click save. And now we want to assign that policy. So we're going to hit the group policy assignment tab. 
and we are going to add a group. And I'm going to go over to this side to the assigned policy group, and I know this was for uh, Mark 8, so I'm just going to type Mark 8, and you'll see there is the Mark 8 project team. So let me click on that. Uh, I'm going to select that policy name. That policy was the Mark 8 project team meeting policy. So I'm going to click on that. And then I'm just going to click apply. So we've now configured that meeting policy per user or per organizer, but we've created a custom policy that is a little less restrictive and more tailored to what we need for a specific group of people. So let's go back up to our knowledge, to our uh, presentation, and let's do a little uh, pulse again with a knowledge check. Stephen, you want to bring up that knowledge check for us? It is up. No, I mean, it's not. I, know. I do not see it. Give me a moment. Maybe I'll <laughs> stop. That's why I have to first request control. This is the fun, funness of doing a session in the evening after we've done several. Oops, nope, try again. Really? Nope, One thing stop up sharing. All right. And oh. see if that helps. All right, no problem. I'll just switch over like this. I'll do it the cool manual way. There we go. All right, which of these policies is false? Hold on, don't see it quite yet. There it is. There it is. All right, why don't you read it? <laughs> so which of these statements about global policies is false? Global policy is the org-wide default. That sounds true. I'm going to say that right now. All users in your organization are automatically assigned this policy. Uh, and C, global policies are assigned to all companies around the world. <laughs> mm. So... I think that global policy is the org wide default. I believe I just showed that in the uh, in this in the uh, interactive guide. Uh, and then B, Stephen, all users in your organization are automatically assigned this policy. Mm, maybe, maybe not. Could okay. be a little confusing. Right now, you're at sixty percent of people think it's C. You're at about a third think it's a global policy, and the ones who are on the fence are just picking B because they're not sure. I am pretty sure that that's only because they read the question wrong. Which one of these statements is false? Two of yes. these are true. Yes, two are true. One is false. Pick the yes. one that's false. Oh, so I think at least our, our, our <laughs> at least our crowd got the right answer. The majority of them. The false one is global policies are assigned to all companies around the world. Yes, that actually that, don't feel bad. That actually messed me up the first time I read it. I looked at it as true and didn't see the work. And, so it's, and it's to say that it's, that it's false, that's not also true. It could be true that all global policies are assigned to all companies. I'm just saying that a specific global policy that I create is not assigned to all, all, all companies around the world. They can each assign their own global policies. Yes, absolutely true. All right. We have a few questions that have since come in. Uh, one is, is the transcription done in Teams or Stream, and where do you find the transcript? Well, now there's two different types of transcripts. A, you can do transcription, you can start transcription in a meeting. This is important if you're not recording the meeting, but require a transcription. This is great for things like board meetings or education or meetings where you dot want to document everything that is said or even for legal purposes that you can do that is available to all the members of the meeting once they're done. If you're using the transcription service, that video can be saved to either OneDrive or Stream. And once that has fully processed, when you replay the video, you will see um, a little button that says transcription and it will pop over to the right and then you can search it. It works really well in Stream. The feature is a little more difficult to use in OneDrive. It takes a little longer to process, but it does work just as well. So those are the two different types of transcription. And I wanted to make sure that's clear because the newer one, start meeting transcription is relatively new. How can organizations make it easier to communicate with users from other organizations? The issue I currently face is that when a meeting with people outside the organization ends, people's names change to unknown user, making it impossible to know who left what messages. Again, 
you need to go into Azure AD and you need to go ahead and federate out to those users, add them in or make it part that will keep it. If not, we'll see names, but as soon as they leave, because there's no identity to connect it to, it's gonna go back to being anonymous, uh, much the same way it is during a live event, we see lots of names and then they, they disappear when they're done. So you will need to use Azure Active Directory as part of that. All right, I don't think there are any other questions that we got, so I think we're ready to move on to next. There are other ones and they're being answered by our team, but those are the ones that they're surfacing up to us. And so Brett, this question. one's- We're gonna yeah, take they are awesome. less of Thank them you. to get through this. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So manage meeting settings, uh, this one's all you, and then you have a demo right after this, unless you would like me to take it, Brett. I, we're going to actually uh, skip the demo on here because it's just a quick one that we're really just going to show you that there are things you can set up and manage meetings. Uh, it, I don't know if it's there you go. You can see it. It's a little hard to see, but I'll just read this up at the participants. The most important one is anonymous users can join a meeting. This is set to off. This is a this is a security uh, thing that uh, if you are you want to uh, make sure that your meetings are secure, we recommend that you keep that turned off. Uh, and then anonymous users can interact with apps in the meetings. That's that's a little you can do on or off. Uh, the email invitation in the middle, uh, that is basically just the ability to put your logo in there, set up a legal disclaimer, help URL and a footer that goes into the into the invite that is sent to the participants when you schedule a meeting. And then last but not least, there's the network. Uh, the first thing is you can insert quality of service markers for real-time media traffic. That allows you to analyze the call quality later. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the meeting quality later. And then you can also specify the ranges of ports that you want to use to better uh, to better to have a better meeting experience, better audio, better video, uh, better screen sharing. And again, that is a process that you do a lot in your planning around your network. But also, you can tweak this as you go. These aren't, they don't, once you pick one, you don't have to stick with it. You can make changes to it. Awesome. All right. And if you'd like to go through and practice that, we have that. Managing meeting recordings. So uh, there are some great choices. So you can uh, capture, of course, audio, video, screen sharing. But it's important to understand that users have to have an appropriate license in order to do this. Uh, consent to the company guidelines if set up by the administrator. Sufficient storage of Microsoft OneDrive or Microsoft Stream for recordings to be saved. Cloud recording must be set to on. And user cannot be anonymous guest or federated user in the meeting. So uh, pretty important to remember that. All right. Brett, are you? we're going to walk through using audio conferencing. Yes, this is, a, this is a pretty good one here. Yep. All right. So using audio conferencing. What is audio conferencing? Think of a bridge. Think of those numbers that you see at the bottom of your meeting request saying dial in number only, uh, toll, toll free. This is for when you don't join through Teams, you join through an actual, you know, a flip flow with no Internet. Uh, we do allow users to dial in meetings when they can't use the Teams client and you can allow up to 30 attendees can attend a Teams video uh, or audio conference. Now, why, when is it a good audio conferencing, a good option? I'll take that. This handsome gentleman will help us through. It's when internet connectivity is limited. Uh, pretty obvious on that one. When a meeting is audio only, which you may do, or when there's an inability to use a PC. Some other advantages to this are calling quality is better uh, when calling in. Uh, people can use and join the meetings from hands-free. This is especially important if you have folks who are out in the field where you don't want them using video or it's going to be difficult where calling in can be good. And some people find it easier or more convenient for their situation. I know, especially with hybrid, people often are running errands or want to take a work during the workday. Joining audio is going to be one of the easiest ways to do that. So, Brett, what are the prerequisites for audio calling? Is it available in my region? That is always the, the number one question. Uh, teams calling and teams calling plans are available in specific regions. You wanna make sure that you check on docs.microsoft.com or in MS Learn or in adoption.microsoft.com or even in tech community. Is it available in your country or region? Do you have the proper licensing for Teams audio conferencing? And do you need to purchase communication credits for the users who are assigned audio conferencing licenses? Think of communication credits as those old phone cards. 
uh, do I have enough credits to make a long distance phone call? Yep. All right, let's take a look through some of the deployment decisions. Again, what are the team's admin roles that you set up? Do you have conference bridge numbers and phone numbers? Conference bridge settings so that again, that folks can dial in and get to that, that has to be there and it's gonna be part of all of the uh, meetings. Default and alternative languages, dial the numbers for meeting leaders so they show up as presenters, not attendees. And of course, as Brett talked about, those communication credits. Some additional things, are there outbound calling restriction policies that you need to put in place? You don't wanna run up large bills for calling certain areas or don't wanna allow certain types of calls to be made via Teams. Dial plans and monitor and troubleshooting meeting and call, call, and call quality. Sorry, it has been a very long day for us boys and girls. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Brett? Great, so we're gonna do one, uh, another interactive guide. And this is a, a, a few exercises. We are going to configure an auto conferencing for Microsoft Teams. We're gonna acquire a regional conference bridge number. We're gonna configure that bridge number and then we're gonna sign a dial-in phone number for users who are leading the meeting. So they're gonna actually use that bridge. So I'm gonna jump into that, uh, into this interactive guide. All right, looks like we can see it, and I'm going to click Start to Interactive Guide. Just a note, by the way, I didn't tell you, on the bottom here, we have a left arrow and a right arrow. That's if you want to do this as a click-through. You can see there's a microphone and closed captioning. It's really small. There you go. You can see it a little better there. All right, so we're going to acquire a regional conference bridge number. To do that, we're going to actually go into the Teams Admin Center. I know the URL is HTTPS admin.teams.microsoft.com. I've typed it enough enough in my career. Uh, we're going to sign in. I'm going to just use the copy and paste from the right. Copy, paste, next, and type in password. Great, we're in. All right, so we're in the Teams Admin Center, and we need to open this up, and we need to go and add uh looks like i want to say voice yep voice phone numbers we'll click on phone numbers and we're going to add a new phone number uh now this phone number is going to be in australia it just happens to be where i created this we're going to call it the australia bridge there we go and then we're going to add a little description this is going to be for the perth office i'm going to use copy and paste and we just said that this whoops Oops, there we go. And we just said this was going to be where? Australia. Perfect. All right. So we've now, oh, and the number type is going to be a dedicated conference bridge. So it's actually a toll number. There is the option of toll-free numbers as well. Those are, again, things that you would need a license for and credits for. In the city of Perth, the area code should pop up as Australia, which is eight. And we're just going to do one here. So let me just type in one. Oh, type in one. Perfect. And we'll click next. All right. So we now have that number. I want to place that order. It looks like I've got 10 minutes to complete that order. Perfect. Your order has been placed. All right. So now we've assigned that number. The next thing we want to do is configure that. So let's go and find that number. Luckily, with the interactive guide, I don't have to remember the exact number. I can look for the box. There it is, and I want to edit it. And I'm going to zoom in here. I want to assign this as a conference bridge number. A resources count would be something like a uh, um, an auto attendant or a call queue, which is something you would use for a call center. All right, so there we go. We've now created that, and it's now a conference bridge number. I'm sorry, now we've acquired that number. Now let's configure it. So we're gonna go and find that number again. So we're gonna to go to meetings, conference bridges, and now let's find that number. There it is. And then we are going to edit that number. And you'll look on the, you'll see here that, whoops, you'll see that it gives me a default language of Australia, but let's add some alternative languages. Uh, there's a lot of Chinese spoken in Australia, Chinese tradition, uh, traditional Hong Kong and Chinese Taiwan, so we'll put both of those in there. And we'll apply that. Uh, and then we're gonna go to bridge settings. 
I'm going to zoom in here, and this is where we can actually set the pin length. Oftentimes, when you get a dial in, it'll say, and your conference code is, or your pin number is. We're going to make that a little longer. We'll make it six digits. Perfect. All right, and let's apply that. And we're going to set that conference bridge as our default. And we have now, whoops, I'm sorry. We have now completed configuring that conference bridge. And now real quickly, because we're running uh, short on time, I'm going to assign that to a user. So I'm going to go back into my Teams Admin Center, and I want to look under here, and I'm going to click on Users. And we're going to pick Irvin Sayers. He's going to be our, our, our conference bridge uh, recipient. I'll scroll down. And here you'll see it shows the audio conferencing information. It's on. Uh, I can send him the conference info and email. I have a pin, but now let, but you'll see it's a 312 area code. I think that's actually Chicago. So let's go. And it is. Is it? I grew up in Chicago. That is the old school Lee. Chicago. Yep, there it is. 312. That was Chicago. a complete guess. Nice. All right. Done. We're going to use that Perth number. Where is it? I think it's right. Oh, we're going to scroll down. There we go. Perth. I think it's that one. Yeah, it is. All right. Great. Uh, and then I'm going to toggle. Uh, Dial-in callers can be the first person in the meeting. No, I want the meeting to have started before a dial-in caller shows up, just to make it a little more exciting. I'm going to click Apply. And then what I will do is I'm going to send that conference info in an email. So Irvin will get that email with the conference bridge number and the PIN. Boom. Quick, quick demo on audio conferencing. But again, right. feel free to go and do these at your own pace on your own. They are available in Teams. Uh, cool. Our all right, let's talk about planning for live events. What are Teams live events? We're watching one right now. Live events are intended for one-to-many communications with a host like myself or Brett leading that interaction. These can be scaled up to 10,000 uh, participants and can be included. Things like all hands and public webcasts and a variety of meetings. So who can create and schedule live events? Well, just about anybody can. It's up to you to give that permission for folks to be able to do that. You simply go to where it says create a meeting, you hit the drop down, choose live event, and you're able to go. You go in. In order to do it, users must have an Exchange Online mailbox, either Office 365 Enterprise E1, E3, or E5 license, A3 or A5 Microsoft 365, a Microsoft Teams license, and a Microsoft Stream license. If a, li a license is required, participate in a live event as an authenticated user. Now, that's important. That's someone else who's going to be presenting or doing things like this. But this requirement is dependent on the production method used. For events produced in Teams, the user must be an assigned a Teams license. So that's the producer license. You're saying, well, what is the producer? The producer is the person who takes a look at what gets sent live and manages the different shots, that's part of it. So, and you're seeing an example of it up here, choosing what to send live and moving between. Who can attend live events? Well, depending on whether or not the event is public or private, attendees and live events may include a specific group of people, all employees of a company, or public anonymous users like you would do for most external webinars. We're going to talk about monitoring call quality now. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but I do want to take a few moments and talk about the two tools that you can use to monitor and troubleshoot call, troubleshoot call quality problems. The first is the CQD, the call quality dashboard, and the second is the call analytics tool. Call analytics is available in the Microsoft Teams Admin Center. And you can go in and it will tell you how many calls have happened and what the level of quality of those are, how many were made, how many are meetings, what the average time and length of those in, how did they come in, PSTN or VoIP, et cetera. Call quality dashboard is going to give you additional information like what was the quality of those? How did they come in? What devices were folks using? So if there are problems, you can try to understand, hey, we need to get better headsets or we need to reduce the video quality or things along that line. It will help give you the information that you need. So the call quality dashboard designed to help teams, administrators, Skype for business admins and network engineers optimize a network with the help of the location enhanced reports Aggregate call quality is reliability 
sorry, and reliability within the user's building can be assessed to determine if the problem is a single user or if it's something that is affecting a larger segment of users. Who can access it? A wide variety of admin roles, and we talked about the different levels of those earlier, and it's important to ensure that you have different folks set up for that. Brett, and I think turn. it's also great to note that that call quality, quality dashboard data yep. can be integrated into Power BI. Absolutely. Or you easier. can export it into JIRA or third-party tools as well. Absolutely. Very important. So that is the module of around managing meetings and calling. Uh, we talked about planning for meeting and conference deployment, uh, managing meeting policies and settings, managing those meeting recordings, audio conferencing. Uh, uh, then Stephen just talked about live events and call quality. Now, if you want to go and take a look at all of the available uh, uh, modules and learning paths, go to learn, aka.ms, learn live teams. That is the link for the right. team's homepage on MS Learn. Uh, we also have several other resources here. Uh, if you go to aka.ms slash uh, Learn 248, that's the actual module. Learn Live is the actual, it will take you to the Learn Live channel on MS Learn, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And then again, please, please uh, fill out a session eval. Uh, and then I want to talk about one more thing before we answer some of your questions at the end here, two more things actually, is the Microsoft Ignite Cloud Skills Challenge. This is part of the learning zone where you actually came for this live session. But what the Cloud Skills Challenge is, is we've created a collection of learning paths and modules that run about 18 hours, 18 to 20 hours of learning. Uh, we have one for Teams, we have one for Microsoft 365, one for security. If you go in and sign up and complete one of these collections, you will receive a, a certificate for a free certification. Now, we have a team thing. Teams. We have a team certification, but you can take the learn. You could do the team's learning collection and not and use that certification on any certification. It does not have to be attached to that collection. We recommend it. We hope you do. But some of those are Azure admin, Azure data scientist, data analyst, security operations analyst, Teams admin, and Microsoft 365 enterprise admin. No purchase necessary. Blah blah blah. Legal speak. And then the last thing I want to show you is. We are launching Learn Live TV starting March 15th. This is the that link I'd said, aka.ms slash learn live. This is uh think of this as a rotating set of broadcasts where you can have things like what Stephen and I did with you today and walked you through a module. It could be a, a, a 15 minute talk talk session or um a, just a you know, hey, what, what's going on? Uh, so this, you can join them every Monday on Learn TV starting March 15th, uh, and they will be uh, starting the show by looking at Azure S SQL fundamentals. But there's over 2,000 topics in Microsoft Learns, and they'll be covering all kinds of things going forward. Whew. Awesome. All right. Do we have time for a few more questions? How much we've time do we have about, left, Brett? Yeah, we've got about five minutes, so let's ask some questions. All right. Let's Answer see. Questions. Ian asks, I saw that you are rolling out a webinar-specific surface. Will this have SIP integration so we can use our room-based infrastructure? Yes, but that's not coming until later this year. But yeah, I, got, I had that question pop up in one of the earlier sessions. And yes, it will support SIP. Um, I don't have all the details on that, unfortunately, but yes. It will. All right. Let's see. Are there any other questions? I just lost all my questions. I just lost all my questions, too. They all just disappeared. Oh, hang on. I see. Oh, let's see what happened. I'm trying to see. I'm going back. Hang on. There we go. All right. Let's see. Um... I thought meetings were stored in stream. Is that still the case? Meetings can be stored in stream or in OneDrive. So you have the choice now between the two. That's something that is newer. So you do want to check that out. Are the pre-authorized default meeting policies good enough for my business? Brett, I'll let you answer that one. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that one? I was looking at it. Sure. Question. Are the pre-assigned default meeting policies good enough for my business? <laughs> That's a yes and a no answer. Yes, yeah. they 
are and no, they are not. We provide the way that this is set up is that the pre the pre setup is what we think is a good a good enough solution. But we always recommend that you take your business priority priorities uh, to heart when you actually set up these policies, because it's very important that you set up these policies uh, to tailor specifically what your business needs are. Again, like if you're there, there are different types of business, you know, if you're a call center versus a marketing organization versus a, you know, a Fortune 500 company, you're going to want to make sure that you tailor those uh, very specifically. And we do we offer a lot of those, you know, tips on how to do that in uh, in our adoption uh, uh, documents in our tech community, especially around security and secure score. So. I say, yes, they're good enough to start, but I would definitely go and tailor them to your organization. All right. Our last question, and I don't know, Brett, if you have an answer for this, but is the exam voucher good for both Pearson View, PSI, and CentraPort? That is a very good question. I don't know the answer to that one. You would probably want to go to the uh, the Cloud Skills Challenge uh, page and It'll find all out be more listed information there, about yeah. that. It'll all be listed there. All right. Uh, is the choice for a OneDrive a group policy? Yes, it is. Yep. Uh, da, 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 da. Is it possible to set up more organizers? Sometimes we have used cases when we'd like to have more organizers. I'm assuming you mean for a live event. Yes, you can, as long as they are licensed users. So, yes, you can. And I think that's time. Yes? Uh, we actually have a couple more minutes here. Let's Finish right, we're getting a few new questions. Few. Um, uh, the LMS question that we had earlier uh, that you mentioned, Harvard. Yes. Can yep. that approach be used with Dynamics 365, FO, and HR? Do you know what those are? I don't know on that one. I'm not sure. So uh, I don't believe so, but don't quote me on that. Again, uh, we did put in a link for you, so make sure to check out the link, and that will help. Uh, wait, so there's a choice now where recordings are saved. Originally, they were supposed to go to OneDrive away from stream. Is that not the case anymore? Actually, it's the opposite. They were going to stream when you record a meeting. Now they can go to either to stream or OneDrive, and you can set up a policy. This allows, though, to be to be stored in a local user's OneDrive or stored in, st in stream. So you have the choice. All right. Great. Well, I think we are about done. It uh, doesn't look like there's any more questions. Uh, oh, no, I got one more. Sorry. One oh, last shoot. one. Great session. Glad you stayed awake. How do you get to the transcript if you're not recording to stream? Uh, there's a new feature in Teams, which you may not have yet, depending on what ring you're in. But you'll see it says start transcription. And you can have that doing a live transcription over on the side, actually taking everything everybody's saying and storing it, and then it can be shared with all the meeting participants. You may not have it yet, depending on if you're in first release or insider, but it is coming to GA very soon. And I wanna, right. I, I wanna say, and I'm not, don't quote me on this, is that it posts that transcription, the, 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 recorded, the recorded file into your chat of that meeting? Yes, I believe that is true. Yeah. But again, don't quote us on that. We, we, you know, every day I come in, we find something new. We learn something new. That's how teams yes. are very agile, uh, which is also a great point is that when you go and look at these uh, learning paths and modules on learn, uh, we try to update these as frequently as possible, but we also update teams as frequently as possible. So sometimes we will we will we will lag behind because we are we are innovating so quickly. So bear with us. We try to keep all the. Uh, all the content in, on MS Learn applies to uh, features that are in product now, not features that are coming in the next six months. So that we have to, once once that feature becomes live, we actually have to go and update these learning paths. So we will be going through and updating these as we go. Just wanted to give you a quick note on that. And also feel free to uh, reach out to me on Twitter or email uh, at uh, brett.polin at Microsoft. If you are, if there's an interactive guide that you're interested in us creating, because we've created about 15 of them, but we, we're always looking to create more. Yep. And catch me on Twitter and catch our inside Microsoft Teams, aka.ms slash inside MS Team Show, where we talk about a lot of this, have some great guests and give a lot of practical information. Even though we're done, we're going to hang out in the chat for a few minutes once we're done here and answer a few more questions. Thanks for joining us. And 
What if people love this session so much they want to recommend it to somebody else, Brett? <laughs> That's great. Again, just go to Learning Live. These are will be recorded and be available to rewatch. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Great. Have a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're at. Great. Thanks so much, guys. Happy Ignite.